Ooh, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up? Welcome back. Uh, today we're working on my image to ASCII neural network. Uh, so the idea is we have an image on the left and we want to turn it into text on the right. If we look a little more closely at this thing, it is a bunch of like UTF-8 characters. <clears throat> and the point we're at now is uh, we've trained a neural network to basically mimic this like labeling scheme that we've come up with, uh, right? It like does pretty much the same thing. Um, and it does it significantly faster in Python land using PyTorch. So uh, when we ran it on a 1080p image at some point, we were seeing like around like two and a half seconds, two seconds um, for a 1080p image with our labeling scheme. And we with the neural network, we were seeing around like 10 milliseconds, so around like a 200 times speed up. Uh, which kind of like proves the concept that uh, by taking this rule set and compressing it down into a neural network, we should be able to get the same thing faster. And more importantly, we should be able to get it in real time. And you might ask like, why the hell is it so expensive? And it's because we're doing like a semi-complex matching metric. Um, so the default thing you would probably do is you would try to match the brightness of each glyph to the brightness of the sample that you're looking at. Um, but that comes up to a much worse, in my opinion, uh, fit than something like this, uh, where we're actually trying to fit the shape of the glyph to the shape of what we see in the sample. Um, and so we use a neural network to make that go faster. And so yesterday we looked at um, taking the network that we trained in Python land and we exported it in a format that we came up with on our own um, so that we could run that thing in Rust. And we found that that thing was like a little bit slow. We didn't really look very closely at it. I think we didn't even turn on release legs, but it was slower than we thought it should be. And uh, we had we know that we can speed it up. So what we ended up doing yesterday was uh, we took like our neural network, which is essentially like a really stupid neural network that happens to be good enough. Um, and so you can imagine like each input here is like one pixel of the sample that you're trying to convert to an ASCII character. Then there's like a bunch of stuff in the middle, boom, 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 boom. And they basically multiply each of the inputs um, by some weights that the neural network has like learned to come up with like 15 ideas about what is important for the task. And then that gets splatted out into like however many characters there are. And I think there's like 1500 characters here. So it's like something like, uh, 54, char 54 pixels in, 1,500 characters out, and each one of these guys gets multiplied by each of these inputs as well. And so what we did was we looked at this picture, and we're like, that looks kind of like a graph. And we looked at our, like, outputs, and we said, okay, so if we want to get, like, this number, what do we do? Well, we need to, like, resolve each of these guys. So we know that we need, like, this node, this node, this node, and this node. We know we need their numbers in order to, like, do this. And then we're like, okay, so from there, well, we need this node, this node, and this node. And we treat like each of these as like individual numbers um, and then just like constructed a graph and resolved nodes in the graph based off what we needed to get to our outputs. Um, and that's kind of silly uh, because if we want to do something like uh, batch these operations for SIMD, uh, that what we need to do is we need to like collect like operations and stick them together. Um, and so we want to find a way to be like, okay, so what are all the multiplications that I have to do right now? And how do I like stick them together in a way that's like efficient? <clears throat> and so I was thinking like, well, we could look at this graph of things that we generated and try to like look at what things that we can resolve right now. So like we know that these are our inputs and we know that like each of these nodes does not have any dependencies and we could like batch all of the multiplications together. Um, but then somebody on YouTube in the comments pointed out correctly that uh, it's stupid that when we construct this graph, we're just throwing away the information that we already have. And so the information that we have is that this is like one linear layer of the network. And we like just threw that information out. And this is one linear layer of the network. And uh, if we just, tr we're, we're, we, we almost got there yesterday. Um, we were looking at like the inputs and we're like, we should just use the inputs as one set of 15. But then we got stuck because we saw, well, when we do each of these, when you calculate each of these nodes, how do we then collect these guys together and treat them as if they're one item? And uh, the answer to that is linear algebra. It's pretty obvious now that I think about it um, because it's like exactly how the things were stored in Python land. So in, in PyTorch, they stored these collection, the, these like weights here along with, I guess just these weights here, 
um, which are like, you know, you have 15, if this, if there are 15 things here, or sorry, there are 15 things here, and there are like 54 things here, they stored 54 multiplications, or 54 multipliers, these edges, um, in one row of an array. So they store like 54 things here, and they store the next 54 things here, do, 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 and they just store them all next to each other. And then when you do like a matrix multiplication, you take your input and you say, I have 54 things here. And you multiply this out, you end up with like, you do like a, you take the, the column and you multiply by the row, and you get out like 15 numbers. You get like a thing that's like a 15, 15 wide instead of 54. And so we can just store the things like that. And then all we have to do is, um, once we have the information this way, we can just try to optimize a matrix multiplication, which is like a well-known simple problem. Uh, well, not simple, sorry, a well-known problem. Um, and there are lots of libraries that can help with that, but I think it'd be fun to try to like work towards figuring out how to make that go zoom, zoom fast ourself. So that's what I'm thinking. Um, but before we get there, I think that we should probably like benchmark what we have right now, maybe try to see like where the time is going. If we do like a profile of it, we can maybe look and see where the hell is all our time being spent to make sure that this is even like worth doing. Um, then if we will update the data format, update our runner to like work with this format instead, and then see how much fucking faster is that. Uh, yeah, so I think let's just get going. So let's start with some form of benchmarking. So if we go into our application, uh, we kind of had something like this yesterday. So we load our neural network and then we run our like graph where our graph basically just tries to like resolve uh, the values of, for all the outputs recursively. Um, and then we time that and we said this took this amount of time. So if I like cargo run that we saw around to two milliseconds, 2.5 milliseconds. Um, but you can, you know, we put that at release. That's around like uh, 0.6 milliseconds uh, to run one sample. And if we were to say, well, how many samples are we going to do for a 1080p image? Before we did something along the lines of like uh, 1080 over 12. Uh, was approximately like how we did like we had our samples were 12 pixels wide or sorry 12 pixels tall mm, something like that T 12 pixels tall and i think it was like 19 pixels 19 pixels high so it was like something like 1080 over 19 times 1920 over 12 something like that uh so what is that that's 1080 over 19 times 1920 over 12. So around 9,000 times is approximately how long we're, how many samples that we're gonna do to an entire image. So let's say that we just do this for it blank in zero to, let's say just 10,000 for like a little bit of like a ballpark number. We'll just do this thing. And then we'll say, how long does it take to do this 10,000 times? Wow, which is four seconds. Yeah, so pretty shit, pretty shit. And um, we can try to figure out where the hell is that time going. If we perf, we run this like Linux utility called perf, which is like, it basically asks the Linux kernel, if I remember correctly, to interrupt your process every once in a while and like write down, where the fuck was I when I interrupted? And if you do this enough, then hopefully you get some sort of like idea of where all the time is going. So if you do like perf record target, I'm going to do debug first because I'm pretty sure you need debug symbols to get anything useful out of this. Um, oh, cargo build. And actually for debug, let's, let's, let's lower this down a little bit down to like 5,000, maybe 1,000 just for now, just to get an idea. So we can do like perf record target debug application. And so then we can say perf report and it'll tell us where are we spending all our time? And it's like, oh, it's spending, you know, 8% of the time in Gitval, which is actually pretty low. In fact, we only really see 
We don't see any like major hotspots here, which feels like there's something wrong here. Um, oh, but maybe these like stack up. How do I um, see this a little bit nicer? There's another one you can do like perf annotate to like see your hotspots in assembly and be like, oh, here we're doing 9.6, 9 9.1% of our entire application is spent in this like one assembly instruction uh, in get val. Um, and I think if I remember correctly, there's a way to like hook this up to Firefox to like get a little bit of like a cleaner view. Um, and I think you run perf script, perf script, output to temp perf. And then I should be able to go into this like Firefox profiler thing and like load this. Cannot read file. Fuck. What does this guy output? Perf script. Okay. Unserializing profile failure. JSON parse. Especially character at line one, column six. Oh, this was easier last time I tried it. Um, Firefox perf script. Um... Okay, perf record to attach with an existing PID. I don't really care about that. Uh, convert the profile and then plus, they say dash F, what is dash F? Um, man perf script dash F. That's just fields, that should be fine. Is there like a JSON output? Like the, the error that it was saying was like complaining about Complaining about lacking JSON, if I remember correctly. What did it say here? It said, uh, JSON parse, unexpected failure. Firefox profiler perf. <laughs> Somebody must have the answer. Mm. Let's see. Oh, maybe I need the, maybe I need to turn on the call graph thing that they said. So when I said perf record, I think I typed dash G to get a call graph, target debug application. Because they do say that I need to do dash G here. Hey, Moscow, thanks for the raid. Appreciate it. Um, and then let's try running perf script again, and then try loading the profile again. And maybe that will help us out a little bit. Much better, much better. Here we go. Okay. Okay, so how do I, can you, can, oh, it's all on one application, okay, and we can just see, this matches up with what we were seeing in our perf, uh, report call earlier, and we see a lot in our, like, executing of nodes, a lot of give value, I was kind of hoping for, like, a, like, a, oh, stack chart is probably what I was looking for, yeah, 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 and we can, like, maybe, like, zoom in on a section, this is not very, it's all pretty flat, which is kind of surprising. I kind of expected to see, usually I see like deeper call stacks here, but I guess that we don't have any like deep call stacks anywhere in our entire thing. So I guess that makes sense. Does not, yeah, there's nothing in here that's like jumping out as like an obvious problem, I guess. Oh, call tree, here we go. So if I like grab a section of here. Okay, yeah, we do see, what I was hoping, well, not hoping, but what I was expecting to see was I was expecting to see that, like, this branch here was going to be taking some time, like, a bunch of, like, checks that we don't need to do um, for looking for something that we've calculated in the past and checking in. I just assumed that that would take some time. Um, okay, well, I was expecting to see more from this, but that's okay. Um, maybe we just continue on and we still see, try to see how much faster we get if we batch these things in a way that we intuitively believe will be faster. Maybe it won't be, um, but that's maybe part of the fun. So if we go back to cargo, run, release. If network is big, most of the time it would just be memory access. Yeah, it could be, but our network is very small. 
Yeah, but you're right. It could. I guess perf doesn't really record memory access as much as just like overall execution time. But yeah, we'll see. Uh, this is spending a lot of time in vector indexing. Ah, whatever. Whatever. Let's let's just continue on and just see if we get faster. So we'll run with release again with 10,000 iterations, and we're just going to try to remember some catch messages, etc. add up if your memory layouts are not good. Yeah, that, that doesn't... That could be. Um, so we'll just write down that before we were taking uh, 4.3 seconds-ish for 10k iterations. Okay. And so let's try to do what we intuit would be good and that is um batching operations and instead of trying to cache every value uh if we store the layers of the network correctly we should be able to like discard stuff that we don't care about as we move on um okay so we had our let's see let's see let's see let's see uh mr keeves thanks for the resub um Thanks so much for the stream so far. Hey, what are you doing? Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. I'm here mostly for fun for myself, but happy to see that other people can enjoy it as well. How is it represented currently? Possible to explain? Yes, yeah, so let's take a look at that. Um, network. Network pi. Or we can maybe look at network graph. So <laughs> we have this pretty stupid thing where we store basically the... In First we say we, we have a fuck ton of inputs <laughs> then we say hey we have a multiplication and an add and our inputs are going to be all of these different nodes in our graph and we're going to multiply them by these values and then we say oh when we're going to add this value to the input from this node in the graph and so we basically just like do that over and over again for each set of weights um and then when we try to compute we like go backwards and we just like look at what nodes need to be filled in that we haven't calculated yet and we can like work backwards from there. Um, but I think what I want to try is I want to try just storing this as like the matrices uh, that are stored in PyTorch. Like that's just like the obvious answer and I just didn't think of it yesterday because uh, my brain's not big enough or I hadn't done enough reading. Um, so here. Here is where we are generating our network. And here instead of trying to generate each individual input we should maybe try to generate them as a whole so we can say what the input is a type input and uh num elements we can store as a net linear one weight shape one so now instead of one node per value oops this is a this should be self there you go instead of one node per value we can see it as just all the inputs as one vector. Then we can replace this like mall add thing that we were doing before. We were saying, hey, for each weight, no, for each output of the first linear layer, we are going to store one multiply add. And that multiply add is I'm going to multiply all of these things by each of these values, each of these inputs by each of these values. Um, as in, like, we were essentially storing each one of these nodes as one element in our output. And we should just store this as one full thing. So we can say what? Our nodes append. And we can say that the type, instead of saying mul add, maybe we'll call it, like, mat. mat, mat mul matrix multiply okay and the values for our matrix multiply should just be self linear one weight two list i think so this should be something that's like a 54 by 15 matrix and then when we multiply that by a 54 by one matrix um we should end up with a 15 by 1 matrix, which is what we want. And then our second linear layer will do the same thing, but uh, for 15 to whatever. 
Uh, then we need to tack on our ads. So we can just say add, and this is instead of the weights, this is the biases. Okay, and that's fine. And then we just tack it on our rel u. Uh, this is type rel u. And I guess we still need to store uh, where we want our inputs to come from. So our input is going to be node 0. And our add is going to be node 1. So this is taking in the previous node. And then we are tacking on a add after. And then our rel u is coming from node 2. Or maybe we can just do nodes len minus 1 every time. That might be cleaner. Yeah, so we just say we're, we're always doing our thing on the last thing. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. And I think we just do this again, this whole thing again, for uh, linear 2. I think. I think that's that seems much simpler and much easier to work with. And then we then tack on an output. And our output is just is just um, what we got at the end. Len nodes minus one. Okay. That should be much, much simpler. So we can go back into our test script and try to like export this network. Um let's see, we say Serialized network is equal to net serialize. And then we try to write that out to our network graph. And maybe we'll call this network graph two.json. And then we can just compare the two uh, next to each other without having to like recompile. Probably. Probably. Uh, so Python 3 test.py. Okay, and we can then look at our network graph two versus network network graph, and we see they are quite different. Um, this looks sane. Uh, I don't really like that the values. I th oh no, okay, the values are stored as a two D. A 2D matrix that look or a 2D a list of lists, I should say. Which seems sane. Okay. Um I should think about if I'm going to parse this lists of lists in uh Rust, I probably want to store them as a one-dimensional vector. So what might, might make a little more sense for this data format is instead of storing this as like values to list for my matrix multiply. Sorry, I'm in the wrong section. This is in a network. For my matrix multiply, instead of just storing the, the, the weights as they are, it might be like easier to parse from Rust if I say uh, width... Uh, Width is self linear one weight shape one and height is zero and the values then I can like store this as like a one dimensional array. Uh because the reason I'm doing this is because there's like automatic parsing of uh automa the uh, the way that the automatic parsing of JSON in Rust will work is that it will try to allocate that 2D list as a vector of vectors. And so all of my like memory for the matrix multiply will be like scattered and it makes more sense for it to be all in the same place. So I, if I then take this guy and I say, uh, what is it, view? Is that, that the way to like just take the stuff and view and look at it as a 1D? Uh, torch view. I wanna take like my 2D tensor and just look at it as one dimension. Uh, yeah, so I can just say view and view it as, can I just say like negative one to like automatically figure it out? 
I think that works. We'll see. Uh, object of type tensor is not serializable. Ah, so then I too list this. Okay, so let's look at that again. N network graph two. And now I've got one giant list of values that goes uh, for 810 lines. Perfect, 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 perfect. That's just what I wanted. So I'm just gonna apply that same thing here to linear two. Okay, cool. Uh, so now we can update our Rust parsing of this thing. Uh, so we can go to, uh, sorry, we should run this again. Okay. And then we can go into our application and we can look at our main and here we're going to say network definition two is network graph two. And maybe we'll just put all of this shit from the first part in like a module that says version one. And then we can easily just segment this stuff later. Um, so here we are saying that uh, first we have V1 this v1 this okay uh what doesn't it like what doesn't it like oh because all of this stuff gets fucking it's all private oh that's annoying so maybe we'll just uh rename main to like run and we'll just do all of this shit in this run function because then we don't have to worry about like Private public shit, this becomes public, and then uh, this has to come in here. Okay, and we will remove this timing, and the timing will come externally. Here we go. There we go. So we have start, end, and v1 run. Cool. There we go. And so now we can just start working on V2. Easy. And what does version 2 look like? Version 2, he's going to still have these like node ops, but they're going to look a little different. Uh, node ops are going to look like... Uh, we still have all of the same operations, uh, but we need to... They're, they're, oh, maybe their names are like slightly different. Let's look at... Uh, go back to our... Mm, dot dot slash dot dot uh dot dot slash lib network here is what it is and so we have input mall add has been renamed to matt mall okay his input is still he's no longer a vector u size vec u size he's only one input he has a single input and he's a single his single input is like a node in the graph uh that represents a vector of elements now instead of a single element okay is a width and a height and values is still a vector of f32 perfect okay then we have this add which is the same we have one input and values now is a vector though so he's gonna add each of these elements to each of the elements in the step before him rel u has an input easy and the output as an input. Perfect. So this should actually parse now. So if we say pub function run, we can pull in the version two of the network definition. And this is just going to be network graph two. And if we try to deserialize that thing, we should be able to say that that should just work. Cool. So we can just uh, comment all of this stuff out from before. And we'll just try to run v2 run. And we'll see what happens. And maybe we'll even print this thing out. Cargo run. Okay. So that did successfully parse, which is great. Which is great. And now, let's see. 
Let's see. What do we do next? We still have this like weird situation where we have to kind of work backwards from the output to get back to the input because we don't really track where our inputs will go. We only track where, uh, where our outputs come from. So it does still probably make sense. We probably still want to do something actually similar to what we were doing before, where we store, um, let's think. Let's think. So uh, something that I, we did before was we like, we, we stored all the outputs for the entire walk of the network for the entire run of the network. And that feels kind of wrong, right? Once you do your first matrix multiply, you don't really need those things anymore. You don't need them. So can we like easily resolve uh, where our inputs are needed and then go forward instead of backwards? Let's think about that for a second. Let's think about that. So you could, you'd say output needs ReLU. ReLU or output needs linear uh, matmol, matmol2. Matmol2 needs ReLU, ReLU needs add, add needs matmol1. And then mat mall one needs inputs. And it would be nice to not have to store everything. Um, what if, so we could just walk backwards and see where each thing goes and then call the operations in that order. That makes sense. Does it make sense to do it that way instead of just storing it forwards instead of backwards? No, I don't think so because each output does have each node does have like a single input thing. Uh yeah, okay. Sure. So what we say walk backwards uh find sequence of operations to produce output run sequence of operations okay that seems pretty reasonable but maybe because what I'm trying to avoid is this like cache lookup thing that we have to do where like every time we like get a value we have to check if it exists or not but i guess with the way that we're storing stuff now this is going to be like an inconsequential cost so i think i'm just going to keep do it the way we were doing it before uh because i find that simpler to think about in my head so we can just do the same thing that we did before so we'll just copy paste this whole computational graph thing that we did which is that we store each of the operations as they came in is like a vector of operations. Um, we store our output cache. And then when we try to get the value for each thing, then we just check if it already exists. If not, we calculate it. Okay, easy. Easy, easy, easy. Uh, this stuff is gonna be slightly different though. So we have a single input now instead of many inputs. So we can say let input IDX is equal to network enumerate find and we are finding the index where I guess this is, uh, this is almost the same as this actually so we'll just keep what we had before but instead of finding a vec u size we're going to look for a option u size and we are just going to run find and we don't need to collect here and we but we do need to map okay 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 there we have our option use size and we then say that we initialize our output caches input with our input so uh 
input IDX, input IDX, say let input IDX equal to input IDX unwrap for now, because I don't want to deal with error handling, and he is going to be some inputs. Okay, which means that our output cache now actually has to store vectors of F32s here inside, which makes sense. Um, and I guess we're going to say that we only support single dimensional outputs for now. In the future, this might need to be like a more complex type if we ever do like 2D like convolutions and stuff, but we don't support those right now, so we don't have to do them. Okay, so get val is now going to return vec f32 instead of a single one. And when we run our input, we don't have any operations on our node op right now, so we can probably copy paste the same thing. It's probably very similar. Um, and let's just take a look at what makes sense and what doesn't. So here, uh, we only ever get inputs that are vector of u size. There's none of this like input. There's none of this like sometimes it's one thing, sometimes it's many things. It's just always many things now, so we don't have to worry about that. And I guess so the all of these guys are just going to copy the input. Okay. Uh yeah. Easy. And I guess for now we're gonna clone and we're just gonna look for these clones as like a future optimization, because there might be a problem there. Um and then here, this is not mal add, this is mat mal. And mismatch type. Expected struct vectors have found u size. Oh, because our inputs aren't a bunch of things. They're one thing that represents a vector. Which means that these don't actually have to clone, which uh, makes things simpler for us. Okay, perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And we do have to dereference them, though. Which ends up being the same thing as the clone was, but with the semantics of looking like a not clone, looking less expensive. What do you use for to do's? Uh, I don't know if you're making a reference to my to do project for like my like task tracking, or if you mean like in code writing like fix me. Uh, I often do this and then uh, set up my linter to like get grep for fix me and ban them so that if I uh, try to commit something and pushed it, uh, with a fix me left in there, it'll like be like, oh, oh, oh you forgot. Uh, but also for these like single person projects that are just me, uh, it's, I don't really have to worry about it a lot of the time because like, uh, I will be able to figure out what I didn't do before pretty quickly, I find. So I don't really feel like the need to like leave to do's letter littered around that often i don't know because I, I, the cost is like much lower when you don't have to work with someone else who has to like debug your problem right um okay so here what are we doing so we take in an input which is just a u size uh and he's not a u size sorry he is the input for this is going to be a slice of f32s i guess when we execute each operation it's always going to be a slice of f32s and now we can just start banging out these implementations. So for a matrix multiplication, uh, we need to check uh, the values as well as the width and the height of our matrix. So we have values, width, height, and dot dot. Okay, so we need to reshape. Uh, well, we don't need to reshape anything, I guess. Uh, but we do need to check that the input size is equal to the width of our matrix. And if it's not, then we'll just fucking crash. And we'll say, uh, expected input length to be same as matrix width. Okay, so for each row of the matrix, we are going to multiply each value uh, with the corresponding value in the input. So we can say, uh, let's see. Our output is just going to be a vector 
with capacity of value uh, of the height of our matrix because that determines the height of the matrix determines the number of output, output values. Uh, and then what are we going to do? We're going to say for uh, for what? Let me think, let me think, let me think. For i in, for y in 0 to height, we are going to push something into the output. And what that thing is, is for x in 0 to width, we're going to do input x times output x. But we're actually going to, like, accumulate these. Right, so we're going to say, like, uh, val is zero, and for each item, we're going to say val plus equals this, okay, um, I guess we have to put a star here, and then we're going to say output dot push val, easy, easy, and then we just return output. Oh, which means that our execution actually doesn't return to F32. It returns a vector of F32. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. And now I'm looking at this and I'm thinking that we made a mistake in our uh, network definition. Nope, we did not. Okay. So we just need to, we need to tack on, we need to support adds now. So the adds, we're going to take in our values and we're going to assert that values.len is equal to the input size. And otherwise we'll say expected input length to match bias or add length. Okay, and then this is simple. Um, we just say let mute output is equal to vec new, maybe with capacity of uh, input.len. And then we can say for x in zero output len, uh, maybe we'll use i here. i makes more sense to me. Uh, we just say output push values i plus input i. Easy. And then we return output. All right. The rel u is just going to look very similar except uh we have output with capacity input length and for i and in input dot len uh maybe we can even do we can use like some like fancy rust iterators for this one we can say uh input into iter iter maybe and then we can say uh map the value is going to be value f32 max 0 0 f32 and the value and we can collect that neat 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 sometimes it's actually nicer to use these rust iterators because they do some like fancy shit under the hood where they like they can predict some form of optimizations for you which is pretty neat uh i saw a bug on hacker news the other day that was like Somebody was complaining about a memory leak, um, which is like a reasonable thing to complain about. Uh, but it was that if they took a vector and they mapped it into from like a, like a U64 into U8 um, and then collected that back into a vector, the vector would end up being like way too fucking big because it would actually reuse the allocation for the U64, which is like a pretty cool fucking optimization, right? That makes a lot of sense. They go like, oh, we know that you are taking a vector and mapping into another vector, and we know that the new elements are going to fit in that size before. So we just like, we don't even have to do anything. We just take the storage and we put it in the same spot, uh, which like dodges a malloc. Uh, but then it ends up in that case where he's like, well, why the fuck is my, why am I using so much memory for something so small? Um, so these like Rust iterators will sometimes just result in code that's like very optimizable from its perspective. So... Sometimes nice to do that. And speaking of that optimization, maybe we should be actually taking in our input as a vector here so that it can do that optimization for us. But for now, we'll just 
you know, ignore that for now. Really, in reality, we should be uh, forcing everything here to avoid allocations if it's in the hot loop. Uh, but we'll tackle that a little bit later. Um, and if output, our output thing, he just returns back the input. Okay. Try using a conversion method. Fine. Fine. Okay, so that's that. And now our get val is going to look a little different. So we're going to say, hey, I'm going to get my input index is the input for this operation. And then we're just going to say, let input val is equal to self.get val input idx. Cool. And then we just execute with input val. And that looks sick. Okay. Now, get outputs is going to look very similar, but we only have one output now. So we do the same treatment that we used for input earlier, where we take it from like a bunch of inputs, just one. And we look for input, and we place this with the output. Easy. Easy. This should be uh, output idx. And then we should say let output idx equal to output idx unwrap. Cool. Easy peasy. And now we only have to do this once. So we just return self get val output idx. Boom. Um, and I think we're actually chilling there. So probably we can just run this network now and see if we get the same fucking thing. I'm not really sure if we will. Uh, actually, this is still bitching. So what's he bitching about? He's got to look at self ops here. So the network. Um, Argo check. Does this compile? Close. Uh, node op output doesn't exist. What? Oh, maybe I have to... Why? What is in node op output? Oh, sure. Whatever. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, close. We now have moved on from the first stage of compiler errors to the second one. I, the Rust language, like, what it does is if you have something that's, like, blatantly, blatantly wrong, it'll be like, oh, I'll stop doing the rest of my compilation and just, like, give up, which makes sense, right? Because it can't do the next step. But then it, it's funny because you, like, you see, like, one error left. And you're like, I'm almost there. We got it. And then you fix that one error. And then, like, 50 more pop up because it's like, oh, now we can borrow check. And now all the places where you didn't use uh, references correctly will pop up. So that's why, like, sometimes it's kind of nice when I'm running Rust. I try to keep it compiling as much as I can. I didn't do that here, but often I will make sure that it's like always compiling so that I don't have to come through and do this like huge list of borrow fixes later. Because this is actually the type of shit that can really fuck you in this language, right? Because you like, you write this whole thing, right? You finally get to compile and then you find out that like the way you've structured your like reference management is just impossible. It's like impossible to fix and you're like, fuck, why didn't I figure this out earlier? And it's because like it doesn't do that stage of compilation until later. But anyways... This should not be a problem. So, there we go. There's, okay, fix me, bad clone. Uh, we'll find them later. We'll, it'll be pretty obvious. I'm not worried about it. Um, op execute here. We store clone. Okay. Card check. Okay, now it compiles. And now we should be able to run this. So, we are going to feed this guy our inputs, which I think here we were just using ones. Uh, speaking of, we shouldn't be allocating this every time. That's fucking stupid. Hopefully the Rust compiler is figuring that out for us. But here, let's um, let's pull this out of the loop and shove this here. So we'll say uh, let input is equal to this. And then we pass in input here. And oh, it doesn't matter because it has to clone every time, anyways. Okay, sure, 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 sure. So, um, I guess we need to return here the outputs. Um, otherwise, we might optimize this out. So, say outputs like this. Okay. Um. What the hell? In V1, outputs return... Oh, you return a single F32. Sure, 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 sure. 
Sure, sure, sure. We'll just do the same thing here. Because I'm worried about, like, the compiler being like, you don't need those. Um, so here we'll do the same thing where you say vec, vec, f32, and then we probably have, like, the same loop-ish. This Maybe it's exactly the same. We'll see. Okay, looking good. And cargo run release. Um, okay, we're crashing, 268. So here he's saying that I'm crashing because the length is zero, but the index is zero. Uh, oh, I see, because my output is... Oh, it's because I'm multiplying by uh, output instead of values. Oops. Okay. Uh, expected input length to be the same as matrix width. So we'll look at 261. And we can print out input length. Uh, input len is input len. I guess we'll do this. And width is width. Input len. This. What are the values it's pitching about? Input length, zero. Okay, so that's a fucking problem. So that is looking like when we do our first matrix multiplication, we must not be returning the thing correctly. Uh, so maybe here we'll say print line output len is output len. Okay. So here we made something that was 15 wide, but then our input length ended up being zero and we tried to feed that into the next layer, which is confusing. Um, maybe we should log the op every time. Print line, executing, some self like this, and then we can kind of figure out where we are in here. Ah, oh, fuck. Uh, so if I print out the whole thing, we get like the big matrices as well. So maybe we say uh, function to string self returns a string. Maybe he returns a static reference to a stir. Probably we can just resolve all of this at compile time. We copy this match. And let's see. We'll just say here input mat mall add relu output. This will give us a clue, hopefully. Then we can say printing this thing to string, like this. Okay, so here we execute an add, relu, and then our second mat mall, he thought the input length was zero. So at our relu, maybe we're doing something stupid here. Print line ReLU input len is input dot len. So here the ReLU got an input length of zero, which means that the add must be doing something fucking stupid. Or we can look at here, we can say add input len is this. I guess really it's fucking stupid to be doing it this way. We should just print up here. Exiting this, input len this. Nice. Uh, input dot len. This will give us a clue, hopefully. Okay, so we're exiting matplotmol with an input of 54 things. Exiting add with an input of 15. Relu with an input of 0. So the add must be fucking something up. So I don't understand. Oh. Fucking. We're idiots. We're idiots. Uh, we're, I just lost it because I was trying to scroll on something. Fuck. Where was I? It was here. Here, we are iterating to the output length instead of the input length. Whoopsies. Whoopsies, whoopsies, whoopsies. There we go. So now we can get rid of all these prints. Okay. And we can time this thing now. And how long does this take? 0.21 versus, so we can say here, V2 took this long, and V1 
took this long. And we can compare. <laughs> Hell yeah, baby! Look at that. So, by batching up our multiplications like that, we gained... What, like... 20 times speed up? Which is still, like, 20x slower than it should be, I think. Uh, but that's that's a pretty... Pretty good speed up. Pretty good speed up. Pretty sick. Um... Yeah. Cool. Um, I guess the next thing to look into... We could try maybe... Uh, we could try... Well, let's perf... Let's look at perf of this guy and see if we can gain some clues about where this is coming from. So, cargo build, please. And... Um, what the fuck is this complaining about? Oh, it's complaining because uh, I commented this out. And a bunch of stuff that was... Uh, how do I say this? How do I say this? How do I say this? Uh, since I wasn't referencing anything from version 1, it was complaining that everything was unused. We can just say, actually, like, allow unused here. And that should fix all of those compiler warnings. Um, 256. This two-string is never used anymore, but that's okay. We'll just allow unused here because it's useful for debugging. Uh, he's looking, he's complaining about unused shit at 325, so, oh my god, this is a, throw an underscore on here, um, try matches, item, node, op, but fine, that's cool, I like that, I didn't know that existed, I think that last time I looked into this it was unstable, but I guess it's been stabilized, uh, what else, it doesn't like that this is unused as well, and it doesn't like man so much unused complaints i don't care like what a oh you wait, wait fine fine and this is also telling me to try matches fine i will i will just for you okay uh what else can we do here we can try to see we yeah we wanted to cargo build release and i wanted to turn on debug info in release mode uh, which is something that you can do. I think it's here. You say, like, profile... Profile release debug equals true. I think. Cargo build release. Okay. Sick. Sick, 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 sick. And then we can call perf record target release application. And perf report. And... Nice. Uh, so we can see that a bunch of our time is spent in get val. And we can actually maybe see some of like the hotspots in here, which is kind of fun. This is like much more what I was expecting to see last time, by the way, um, in terms of like a reasonable profiler output. Here, like 70% in our like get val is like, yeah, that's our hotspot. So that makes sense. There's also a lot of like uh, unresolved function pointers here, which is kind of weird. Perf report. Yeah, I don't understand what all of this is, but I guess maybe if we look at um, perf script to temp.perf, maybe we will see that in our call stack in our in the Firefox profiler. Let's see. Uh, okay, so unknown, unknown. Unknown, 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 unknown. Where is, like, all this coming from? Oh, if I expand this, it just stays exactly the same. So this is just going to recurse forever, I guess. Uh, but it does look like this is coming from allocations. Or is this going down? No, this is coming up. So this is get val is calling unknown. And that's taking 27% of time, which makes sense. Which makes sense. Um, I wonder. Perf annotate. Does any of this, like, give us clues as to where the time is going? Node op execute here. What is all this? 
These are coming from Val plus Eco. Oh, this is kind of cool. Yeah, so it kind of like shoves in the assembly along with the line it's associated with. So here they're saying that you're ta we're taking a lot of time in the matrix multiply, actually. Here we can see Val plus equals input times values. That's the matrix multiply, and we're taking a lot of time here. I don't know what this 5.49 is from, but this is what? Like, this is a 2.23... Two, five, nine, ten, fifteen. This is like twenty-five percent, maybe, in this matrix multiply. So that's like a that'll be pretty fun. We can like see if there's a uh, SIMD thing that we can do there. I was expecting to see more in like allocations, to be honest, because there's so much like vector cloning and stuff. But I guess the numbers are so small that the, and those allocations are probably pretty quick. So I'm not seeing anything crazy. Oh, unless the allocations aren't in this get val function. Uh, get val. He has this clone here. So can I perf annotate? And is there a way to like see show by like function line? Can I like turn off the assembly and just look? Um, show full source file location, uh, print symbol name, show full source file location, toggle line numbers. Okay. Toggle source code view. Oh, this, this was already the source code view. That's annoying. So maybe there's no way to like... Toggle disassembler output simplified. Ooh, simplified view. Nope. That's not what I want. Um Damn. Damn, damn, damn. To Vec. Yeah, there's it's not what I was hoping for. I was hoping that I could see. But surely all of this is coming from allocations. So we do see like 27% in allocations and 9%, 10% of those allocations are coming from get val, assuming that this unknown is an allocate. And I'm pretty sure it is because we can see int malloc calls this function. So we are we could get like another like 10% speed up probably by reducing vector clones. Uh, but that's actually kind of less than I was expecting. Okay, well, I think the next thing on the list is probably going to be SIMD. And I need to do some reading before getting there. So I think I will call it there and call it a short one for today because I don't really have anything else I wanted to accomplish. I didn't really plan for this to go so quickly. Um, so thanks for watching, guys. Um, if you liked what you saw, uh, there's... Oh, sorry, I got distracted by chat message. Maybe Rayon good there. Yeah, I'd like to kind of see how what I can max out on single-core performance first before going to multi-core um, because... Uh, I eventually want this to be uh, on the web in WASM, and I think that we don't have threads there. So it would be nice to just kind of like see how fast we can get this going on single core. Uh, but maybe parallelism will be useful in some way. But I think I think I want to look at SIMD first, and I also want to look at like quantization. So like, can we take like our floating oper point operations and like turn them into uh, integer operations, and maybe that'll go like way faster. Experimental threads on Wasm. Oh, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that. Neat. Okay. Sorry. Got distracted. I was trying to trying to wrap it up. So thanks for watching, guys. Sorry for sorry for the short stream. Um, if you like what you saw, I stream most days around one or two o'clock Pacific time for around one or two hours. Um, we're trying to cover a variety of topics. So we've been doing some like operating system stuff. Some like we did like a fuse file system the other day. We've been doing AI. Um, I, yeah, I've got a bunch of stuff we want to work on. So variety of projects. Um, if you miss a stream, there is a YouTube link in the Twitch description. There's a GitHub link there and a Discord link there as well. And if you're watching on YouTube and you want to swing by and say hi, there should be a Twitch link in the YouTube description. Uh, thanks for watching, guys, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye!